Hello everybody, it's me, Captain Psychopath, and... Josh Elliott, from Catalina Video. Long retired, but not dead. <laughs> I mean, you're the director of this very movie, so I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you, I'm excited to do this. It'd be fun walking down memory lane. And uh, if you're watching at home, people, uh, we haven't started the movie yet. We will count down from... Uh, Three when we get to that point, and we're watching mm -hmm. the version on the Catalina Collection Neo. In case you at home want to sync up with us, starting the video at 29 seconds. All right, Josh, are you ready to get going? I'm ready. All right, on play. We're counting down from three. Okay. Three, two, one, play. Play. Oh. Now this soundtrack. Is this uh, Sonic Seduction, or is it just something you had lying around? No, this song was written by Sharon Kane, and a friend of hers, unnamed, I'm not sure who it is, um, did the vocals. Now, I'd heard somewhere, someone had mentioned that it was Sonic Seduction and Sharon Kane working together, and yeah. to be honest, I that could have been true. I know that there was the male vocal in there, and then he kind of, you know, we looped his, his voice a number of times to make it sound like a number of guys singing, like a band. Oh, really? It's just and one guy? It's just one guy, yeah. Huh. And then he just did different layers to make it sound like the band and, you know, different tones with his voice. Um, and it very well could have been Sonic Seduction, but to be quite honest, I really don't remember. But Sharon Kane wrote it with, with, that, uh, with that person. Yeah, because I, I think it says, like, after Steve Rambo makes his introductions as music by Sharon Kane and Sonic, but Sonic Seduction is an elusive fellow. Nobody knows who it is, but he made a couple of bangers. Yeah, and Sonic Seduction, so the music was by Sonic Seduction, um, but that would have been the music for the for the sex scenes and, and the ambient music. Ah, uh, I see. The different scenes. They're gonna rock and roll you all over. Oh, God, you know, those stupid sayings I would come up with. Why does a movie about boy band just start with a guy out in Yosemite? I love it, but why? <laughs> well, because the whole premise of boy band is that um, Sharon Kane, who plays Nance Freely, is a neurotic uh, music agent, and oh, yeah. she's looking for someone from the heartland. You know what I mean? Some all-American... Mm, real country boy. Um, real country boy. Um, that can appeal to the masses, um, that can just um, headline this band, and that's what he's going. He's going to do an interview um, with another singer, but never makes it there. Um, but in the because his car breaks down, um, you know. But in the end, he ends up through all of his trials and tribulations on this crazy Texas chainsaw farm, um, ends up finding the perfect, you know corn-fed young man to lead the band. Yeah, you know, life takes you weird places when you're Archduke. <laughs> I thought that was fart puke. <laughs> yeah, like, isn't the entire reason you named him Archduke just to make fart puke joke? Yeah, I knew I wanted to get the fart puke in there, in the script, yeah. so then I just found a name that would match. I mean, it, it's a good name, because Archduke is... I mean, on the internet, he's grown quite famous, but I don't even know what I'm saying, but I love the character of Art Duke. He just stumbles into the weirdest situation and somehow makes it out. Well, you know, and it's kind of like Rambo himself, to be honest. I mean, you know, normally I would write these roles, you know, where Rambo's not really Rambo, but I would have to say that Art Duke is probably the closest to Rambo's real personality of any character that he plays. Really? Mm -hmm. He's, you know, trying to give his best effort, but, you know, it's just not enough and, you know, and um, easy to be ridiculed by, you know, Missy and others. And but it really is kind of like him. That That's if you think of Steve Rambo, Art Duke is probably the closest character that's really kind of like him. Moving in and out of situations, not really knowing why he's there or how he got there. But in the end, it all worked out. It's poetic. <laughs> also, this rant, like, why is Nance the worst person in the world? Is it like poking fun of the music industry and how horrible it is? Or is it just poking fun of somebody in particular? 
you know, I was just fixated on the fact that I saw her staring and she was staring at the rent that we had like in huge letters on a piece of cardboard in front of her face because it was so long. But the way she read it, it just came out so friggin' natural. But it was there. She's looking at that the entire time and she's reading it. And kudos I to her. because she realized. Oh, you know, it's long. I mean, Sharon Kane's fabulous actress. But you know what? That was fucking long. And it's like, and it was so specific that you really couldn't miss one word or else it really wouldn't have the same effect. So we had that like on a big old piece of cardboard and holding it like a foot from her face. But um, yeah. And that, you know, really that rant really, I think, established her character um, within the movie. You know what I mean? That right there told you everything you ever really wanted to know about Nance Freely. So then it was kind of all just She's gravy. She's the devil, from there. more or less. I mean, this was my introduction to Sharon Kane, and it did <laughs> taint my impression of her for a little bit, unfortunately. Oh my God. Yeah, you'd be thinking that she's walking, talking evil. Oh yeah. I mean, I've seen other movies later and realized, oh yeah, she actually seems amazing. But my first impression was this wig-wearing Nazi, more or less. Like, she's not a Nazi, but she feels Ilsa. like it. She was very Ilsa, she-wolf of the SS, right? From this, from the 1970s. Do you remember that movie? Uh, I think I've, I've never seen it, but I've heard of it, I think. Well, that's what her character is based on. There was the Ilsa series that in the 1970s, it was like, you know, a sexploitation movies. There was lots of nudity in them um, and, you know, very eroticized. And she was just, she played like, um, you know, um, hardcore um statuesque woman in each of these different versions and that's exactly what nance freely was based on in fact i think i was kind of doing a rundown yeah. on ilsa just to kind of get the mannerisms and the look the, the wig was definitely the ilsa wig that we put on there so that is what we're let me just say for. i love this shot right here the cinematography is just mm, superb i do love that shot the shot through the legs i i actually it was i did something on my youtube channel where we actually did um, uh, a deja vu because yeah. I kind of this this exact same lead in like six seven years earlier in a movie called Easy Riders where one of the bicyclists oh. comes up to this crazed uh, crazed sort of hillbilly um, on this ranch in the Russian River and I actually did the shot between the legs and when I revisited Easy Riders I thought oh my god without even knowing but subconsciously shooting it I. I shot the same fucking scene like 10 years later not even realizing I was doing it. <laughs> hey mate, you can't you can't improve on perfection. I guess not. And this really was actually it was an improvement because my cinematography was a little better in this version on Boy Band, I have to say. And then this now is this just scene. classic. Classic. Yeah. I mean, you know. Oh, see, I'm used to seeing the full version there. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it and he that's he pees a lot. It's impressive. You know, and it's very, very rare that I would ever shoot, um, you know, we're very, you know, the Disney of porn over at Catalina we were. Mm. And it's very rare that I would ever show urination. And I shot it knowing that it, I could go back and they could say, cut it. We're not releasing it. Um, but because it was, you know, you know, just out there in the woods, you know, every person's probably done it in their life. You know, it's not like there was another person involved with the urination. That um, I think they let it they let it through the censors at Catalina, and I think it really just added to the scene, you know. It does. I lo it's it's crucial to the plot, <laughs> but also it just with the menacing choir music and just him standing there pissing. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. And then the pitchfork, you know, you just gotta love the pitchfork. You know, adds that adds that little bit of tension there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this, I just uh, I just saw this scene recently because I was doing that. Um, uh, that musician Kegu from um, New Zealand sent me yeah, yeah, a version of the boy band song. And I'm like, oh, my God, can I just use this? You know, and uh, they just emailed me with it and said, oh, we've been playing around with the boy band song. And we did this. And I'm like, can I just use that? Cut something to it. And I discovered this little scene in here, which is kind of kind of homoerotic as well. Where he, you know, tells him that he's got to, you know, earn his oats if he's going to be staying on that farm, yeah. you know, while he's waiting for his car to be repaired. And I kind of like this scene, too. I like the look of it. And, you know, Brad McGuire is just brilliant. I mean, he's just... He's, he's hamming up the hillbilly accent a bit, right? 
there. Oh, yeah, he's definitely... Well, you know, he had two versions of the Hillbilly, if you really think about it. He had this one in boy band, yeah. but I think the next day, the very next day, with the boy band star and Brad, we were shooting Cockpit 2. Indeed. Where um, Brad Austin directed Cockpit 2, and um, they were a different type of Hillbilly. And he complete, completely played a different sort of, you know, scatterbrained hillbilly, not the menacing one of boy band. So, I mean, here's two different hillbillies shot one day and then the next day, and he brought something to each of those roles. He's, he's great. Oh, so I have something to say about this. So, see, the Jeff Burton is our still photographer, and he does all yeah. of these scenes with Nance Freely. So, Jeff Burton, I just spoke with him uh, a couple of days. That's him right there. Oh. And um, he was our still photographer for a decade, right? Shot all the box covers and glamour shoots and all the stills. And he, um, I, I write a blog for Bijou Video now. It comes out every other week. Uh, Will mm-hmm. Seegers from the 1970s, like L.A. Tool and Die and all of these other great movies with Al Parker. He writes the blog, The Opposite Week of Me for Bijou. And I, my next bl- blog coming out is on Jeff, and I wanted to call him to see if I could use his material. Because what happened with Jeff after he left Catalina Video? He had been shooting all of these shots of the sex, but from these cockeyed angles. And he would have certain things out of focus, or he would be shooting like um, a reflection in a mirror. Well, he parlayed all of these... Real artsy. Very artsy. He parlayed all of these shots that he did over a decade into a career so he had a showing in LA which then evolved to a showing in New York which then evolved to a showing in Japan where wow. he was off at his first hardcover book called Untitled Jeff Burton then he did two more books Dreamland and The Other Place and it's all this beautiful art that he does where he kind of now recreates porn sets and we'll shoot the product there. He's got a website called jeffburtonstudio.com. And there is this amazing shot that he did for Tom Ford. And it's for the Tom Ford cologne, where these these three bubble butts laying in some shallow water and these two female hands pouring the cologne over their butts. And it's to die for. He's worked for Louis Vuitton. He's done stuff for Vogue. He's parlayed his porn career as a still photographer where he manipulated everything into like an amazing career. So I just have to give him kudos. I got to check this out. You've got to because it's amazing. And check out my blog on Bijou next week and it's it's going to be good. Bijouvideo.com under the blog section. I'll link it in the description of this video for sure. Thank you. Oh, what's this? Oh, right, okay. This, so uh, this kid... This- not- this is the kid that Ray Harley's talking to in the chair. He's the one that Rambo was going to have the meeting with before his, he got the flat tire. Okay. Oh, it may yeah. not be that clear in the movie, but. Um, no, I actually didn't realize, but I, I, it's clear now yeah. I, when you said it. Yeah, because later on you see that they hired her boy. Um, you know, this was the boy that Rambo was going to meet, but the competition, Ray Harley mm. and Chad, um, got to him first. And yeah, that's because in my me and Hiko Mori Media's review, we like what happened to the drummer, and of course, <laughs> Ray and uh, uh, oh my god, I'm bad with names. Ray and Chad, Chad, thank Chad you. They Hunt. stole them. Now, this guy's a drummer, but he's the best drummer that's ever drummed, as we say in my old ass video. What do you mean he's a drummer? Isn't he a drummer? I don't know. What do you mean a drummer? I. I don't remember. I don't think we see him again after this shot. What we're saying is, this I don't scene. either. I mean, they do have the little uh, sex affairs and then they wrap it up. But yeah, after that, I can't recall him returning. Yeah, because I think he was just kind of show that he was the one that he's the one so that basically they hired him. So Nance could have her breakdown later when she finds out that they hired him and she doesn't have her lead for the uh, boy band anymore. And then she has this little breakdown. Yeah. You know, coming up. That makes perfect tuned. sense, actually. I just, I never put two and two together. Well, I probably didn't script it properly because it, it is kind of ambiguous, I think, in the final cut. Yeah, well, yeah it's a little bit. It's like almost clear. So it lacks like one something. 
But now this is this a uh, is this a commentary on uh, the Hollywood and its horrible practices or? You mean like the casting couch? Fun? Yeah. Well, there's always a you want to work for us. You're gonna have to give us a mass. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I suppose there is a casting couch in Hollywood, and it probably this this is a play on that, absolutely. But um, it's funny because in porn, there's really never been a casting couch that I know of. I mean, we just you know we would get guys from agents, so we would you know be out you know and meet people, or models would send their friends over to meet us. It wasn't like I'm sure there is casting couch probably in the straight porn world. I'm sure that it's probably like a daily thing. I mean, it's it's yeah. a genre at least. That's true. But um, we've never done the casting couch at Catalina, but we know it exists. <laughs> Unfortunately. Mm hmm. Oh, it wasn't lovely. I don't even know where we shot this. I'm trying to think of what house this is. It doesn't look familiar. I think, I mean, I don't remember, but Kurt or someone found the actual house you shot. I mean, the farmhouse. This is the oh, same yeah. house as the farmhouse, right? This Nancy's no. office. It's not? No, no, no. No, this is in um, LA somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Now, the farmhouse um, we shot, that was by Yosemite. So we shot cockpit there because of all, they had like acres and acres of fenced in land. So, I mean, it was like being out in the wilderness, but yet we didn't have to worry about like, you know, a dog walker. Actual animals and stuff, anything. or like big animals. Speaking of animals, look at her. <laughs> she's having... <laughs> oh, dude, she's so pissed. <laughs> you know, she's... Because this is where she got the, the memo that just came through the ticker tape or whatever that they signed her boy. And this is where he kind dude, of Dude, I must be there. stupid. How did I not realize it was the same boy? It's so obvious. Well, it, it's okay. Don't kick yourself over it. It's not I, I just it. think it's funny. <laughs> and this, I don't even... I know this was in L.A., we shot this, um, it was a day that Brad Austin was shooting an oral scene for one of his movies that was coming out the same year. Mm -hmm. And then when he was done with the oral, I came with Sharon and, and Jeff was already there doing stills. But I came with Sharon and then we shot this dialogue. So I was able to save a little bit on location by smart taking over Chuck's set. Yeah, so this Nancy and uh, her assistant, it was all just shot on, on one day. Like, yeah, this was just just a dialogue day, and it was because I scheduled Brad Austin to do just an oral scene instead of a full, so it didn't you know it took like you know four hours instead of like you know six or seven. No oh, damn. So then I could hop in there and shoot this, but yeah, she's yeah, it's Ilsa. <laughs> she's her facial expressions are just. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, anytime I was shooting with Sharon Kane, I was like on top of the world. I mean, because you know. In porn, everyone's not really the best actors or actresses. No. But, um, you know, when I and I can pull out a good performance, I feel out of most of them compared to, you know, maybe some other times. But um, with her, I never had to pull anything out. She brought it. You know, she's like, she could be on like oh, Peter table, Mary. like late night at least. She, ha she has done stuff for like the Playboy channel. She's done a ton of stuff for the Playboy channel. Probably just in a lot of different wigs, though, and you probably didn't really recognize her, but she's done a lot of that soft core um, for the Playboy channel over the years. I mean, she's been around, you know, forever, you know. No, she definitely has a lot of talent. Singing, decent actor. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, She's been performing and singing since uh, Susie Superstar. I think she wrote the theme song to Susie Superstar in the 1970s. Maybe, she, you know, Shawna Grant, the Shawna Grant movie. Possibly. I'm not too familiar with the older ones. With the 70s porn? Yeah, I'm mostly 90s and above. Yeah, well, that would That's make sense. That's where my sense. knowledge comes from. You know, yeah. You're not ancient, like me. <laughs> you know? I'm getting I was there. growing I'm up in the there. 70s, so the 70s was like we used to sneak into like the porn drive in, in Rhode Island when I was like 16, 17, because there, there was a porn drive in called the Rustic Drive in. They would show porn out. And oh. I actually saw Sharon Kane in Pretty Peaches at that drive-in. No way. Like a decade before I, I'd ever be like even working with her. Yeah, so talk about the six degrees of Sharon Kane. Now this coin game, is it based on something or is it just an excuse for the scene to happen? You know the final scene where all the boys are on the couch after the music video? The boy band? So this is the end up being the boy band here. So I think, well, maybe not. 
Okay, I know that what this scene is, is that they're there to audition, um, I think, for Nance Freely. Without the sound, I'm, yeah. it's kind of hard to know. But I think they're going in to audition, and it's just a reason for guys to have sex. It's basically some filler, but it's like, okay, so these guys are all auditioning to try and get that boy band filled. But then now that yes. you mention it, they wouldn't be having sex here and sex at the end. So, yeah, it's just some guys who didn't make the cut. I you know one of them, like the guy who is currently being uh, held down, the guy who's tying his shoes or something. He he oh, got yeah. into the band, I think. Yeah, so he's the lead singer of the band, and the other one gets into the band as well, but hmm. the other two didn't. So, oh yeah, they're being sent away. Bye. Sorry, Bye-bye. you didn't make it. Take off. Yeah, good luck. Better luck next time. So, yeah, and and Kurt on the left, wait a minute, he's not the lead. The lead is on the farm. Oh. Yeah, 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 that's uh, Kurt Wagner. He hasn't appeared yet. Are they in the band at the end? I know he I is, think, I think. I think this guy is in the band at the end. Oh, he's wearing you know what it is. Something. They weren't there on the same day. So this, I cut this, uh. those two scenes together. These two guys are in the band we shot on the day of the boy band. Thing, and that's the house that they're at after with Nance and they just had him talking to the others but they all weren't there on the same day that's what it was I see scheduling conflicts right so these two do make it into the band as well but does he because he, he, he takes his contract right now right but he still gets in at the end yeah that's right something happens here he's a little slick he's trying to take his his interview with Nance oh maybe he gets in and the other guy doesn't I he think took it. it's been a while since I watched the movie myself so I haven't really refreshed my memories you know, there's so many layers to this movie that <laughs> no, no kidding. it is. It's but, it's quite deep, like this massage. Okay, so this was shot all the same time after Ch- Brad Austin, who's giving the massage there. Um, after he had shot his oral scene, we came in and was doing the dialogues. <laughs> this is the same day as the office scene. It's actually the office. If you just go to the left of that fireplace, that's the whole office right there. Oh, and then um, I forgot who brought the massage table. I think it was our makeup man. Had a massage table, so I asked him to bring it. You know, never know when you need one. <laughs> I mean, I'd need one right now. My neck is so fucking sore. Ugh. Mine too, leaning into this microphone. I'm not used to being hunched over like this. Yeah, no, I think I'm doing the same thing. So <laughs> please support us on Patreon listeners so we can get the massage. <laughs> so he's being a little... Uh, speaks back to her a little bit. and She's been a little... If you excuse oh, the expression, it. twatish to him. And, um, now, this song is actually Norwegian, if you didn't know. Like this, it's called Something Something. There's a song playing? Yeah, it's like very low in the background, like a synth oh. version of a... Oh, really? I'll, I'll give it's you the name when I remember it. Also, this is also an angle that... It's weird, but it's good. I love these angles. I love underneath angles and shotting. Because oh. a lot of movies are just camera facing one actor, then another, and then nothing interesting happens. That's what I like about your movies. It's, they're well, not afraid I'll to tell go you, weird. I used to, well, I used to, I mean, when I first started, it was all about those angles because I used to do the videography myself and I would just, I would just, you know, be constantly doing these cockeyed angles. And back mm. when we were shooting in San Francisco and had a studio, we had this like 20 foot high ladder. So I get these amazing overhead shots that would oh, be like the overhead fantastic. with a zoom and a spin and a pan. And I mean, just like these fluid, beautiful shots. You know, once we got to where I was kind of directing from behind the monitors, it wouldn't be on my mind as much because I wasn't physically doing the camera work to kind of get myself in these positions. So, but once in a while, I'd pull them out again. I mean, it's good to use them sparingly. It gives them a better effect once they happen. Yeah. You know, I have to say the lighting's always very been very clean in this movie. We were with our newest uh, um, digital video cameras at this point. You know, a lot of my older stuff was shot on tube cameras, which turned to mud once they would put them onto VHS. Yeah, and then, um, especially in like I think Hostage at the Grand Canyon, like certain scenes are just the colors are way off. Well, what was the problem there was that we went on a road trip, but we didn't have the proper batteries for our good cameras. So we're shooting everything on it. We called it the L1. 
and it was a different type of format completely. So that it would always, that. there was no cleaning that up. And that was like a huge, I wish they would just have given us the money for the proper batteries. Um, but, yeah. you know, there was, it was budget. I mean, this is a bigger budget movie uh, because it was the big movie of the year. But a bigger mm. budget movie for us was around um, eighteen to 20000 Damn. All the other movies that we would make throughout the year and we'd pump out like two a month would be uh, $12,000 budgets. Now, if you think about it, you got a cast of 10 and you're mm. paying them anywhere from 800 to to 1000 a day for their scene. We've got locations that are $500 a day on average for wherever we shoot. And then you've got, well, back in the old days, you had to pay for the film stock, which was they were shooting everything on film. You know, we eventually went to digital stills. Um, and then you also had uh, the videotape costs. Back in the day, those big honking giant tapes were really expensive, you know, but then now it was little mini DVs that we're shooting this on, so it wasn't that bad. Now here we had proper batteries to get that nice beautiful shot of Half Dome um, in Yosemite to shoot that shot. And there's my partner in a cameo as, um, what's he playing, like Uncle? Or? Uncle Mark. Uncle Mark. So I love this shot on the ground with the kid running away. Yeah, it's... So there's Tony Fontana. Um, and that's my partner for going on 50, 20 years now. 22, actually. I should know that. Yeah, I mean, and then I love this. The years pass by. <laughs> they sure do. Like, you didn't meet him at the set of this movie, right? You were already together. We were already together. I kind of brought him on. He became second cameraman on the crew. Oh. Once we once we were together, I brought him on and uh, we trained him on camera as a position opened up. So he was the second videographer um, on the on the crew for a number of years. Well, up, up until we stopped shooting, you know, with Hot Butter Cup one. That's kind of cute, actually, in like a weirdish way. Yeah, and then when I moved, um, you know, Catalin was still going, but we were just basically remastering all of the DVDs um, mm. or the, the VHS onto DVD. That's when I trained him on editing. So when we moved to Palm Desert together, um, I still worked with Catalina. We have, and we still have it here in the office I'm sitting in, side-by-side -side editing bays. So we were both doing the editing for Catalina. Really? And then Good here, old that's Jeff Burke. Oh, yeah, him. Yeah, Peter Romero. So he's Peter Romero. Catalina yeah, director. I always keep forgetting his name. Like I, I've known this guy like from so many videos, and I've seen lots <laughs> yeah. of Peter Romero movies, but I never realized that this is Peter Romero. Yeah, yeah. So it's always you know easy to you know use ourselves as extras because we don't have to pay anything. And then this is back on that farm, of course, um, with uh, oh, yeah. Rambo and the the guy who eventually him becomes the lead in the boy band. Kirk and, um, Wagner, I think, or Little Man Darren. Little Man Darren. And I think he's also responsible for the choreography because um, I wanted him to get the guys, you know, on the back of that um, flatbed. So when the yeah. in the music video, they kind of do that little, you know, quick step or whatever, spin around. So he kind of choreographed the boys on that. And we just kind of kept shooting it from different angles and you know, would freeze at a certain point and then start enough. Let's find another shot from there. And he was really uh, good in that. And he was great lip synker. Let's say. So here. <laughs> I mean, this shot is just amazing. <laughs> I mean, they're so tired from fishing and dra driving like eight hours. It, I love well, it. That's what you, I think that's what you do in the country. You fish and you sleep. And then you and you hold people captive. You kidnap them. I mean, isn't that like the, the M.O.? No, I mean, since you're the director, you probably know this. Are they actually psychos who captured Little Mandarin, or is Little Mandarin just crazy? Oh, no, yeah, I take the kid at his word. Sure. I think Little Mandarin, yeah, because why would they be so upset? They're taking off. <laughs> there, there goes their, you know, their nighttime dessert, right? Ugh. And that, of course, that's our van. That's our Catalina van that we've had, yeah, you made, know, made a lot of around shoot years. to shoot. <laughs> it sure did. It started out as a white van. I think it oh. made its first debut in uh, Ranger in the Wild Part 2, or Sailor in the Wild Part 2. Um, and I remember getting in a lot of trouble because I shot this whole opening title sequence that was all the van, and it went too long. So this is where Darren um, tells him he's been kidnapped, and uh, then he, uh, in the 
sings a little something, and Rambo gets the idea. He sings like two lines. And okay, I'm yeah, sold. You're, you're leading in. Tell man. me about it. <laughs> He's just that good. Where'd you get such a great voice? Oh my god, that voice is incredible. I practice at home. <laughs> yep. And then all of a sudden, Rambo, the light bulb goes off in his head. Yeah. And um, he saves the day. Isn't that what everything's about? It's all about Rambo saving the day at the end of them all. So, you know, Heck certain yeah. formula. Thus, the day is saved. <laughs> Free from slavery into fame. <laughs> and I'm realizing Rambo never has a scene face to face with Sharon, which is, um, which is right. kind of sad. I'm really kind of sad. They did uh, work together on the cockpit, though. He stabs her real good. She wasn't there. She really? was not with any of us. I wasn't even there when they shot Sharon Kane. She was in a house in Burbank. We were in Yosemite, and hers was shot like weeks later, um, intercut with with Little Man Darren or, or the two boys. It was Little Man Darren in that one too, right? With Brad McGuire as the hillbilly kids. Yeah. And she she had that weird hairdo with the pigtails. Oh yeah, the yeah. She wasn't there. The only time that they were really on the set together, I think is in Night of the Living by Dolls when he was working opposite um, Tori oh god the Something. lead girl in yeah the lead girl in, in um, Night of the Living by Dolls um, she was his wife and they were there on the same day because Sharon actually brought that actress to play that role it was a non-sexual role um, that actress god I can't think of her name she only played um, like in soft porn but she did a lot of soft okay. porn and legitimate movies and she agreed to take on this role um and sharon brought it to the set and you know i didn't even have it cast Sharon was like trust me you'll love her and she was fantastic i have to say so here they are in the back of that thing i mean i have to ask like i what was he even going to ask but like the editing on this music video is uh lame insane in a good way <laughs> well i don't know about how good it is it's 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 really the limitations of what we had at the time um, we were very limited at the time. We didn't have any bells and whistles. I didn't have any, you know... Um, yeah, this is 2001? No, it was 1997, wasn't it? Is it 2001? No, I mean, Jeff I think was still it working came for out us. in 2001 at least, but I don't remember. Mm, I don't know that it was that late, but you may be right. But I don't think so. I thought it was 1997. But it's possible. Don't, don't quote me on it. Right, I'm only the, the maker of it. Who knows? But yeah, look at that. I mean, that... Ugh, that's like MTV 1978. That shot. <laughs> you know, but it was... I just tried to do the best I could with what I had, and that's all we really had. So I did kind of reshoot that video. Um, I did a reshoot... Uh, not a reshoot, a re-edit of that recently for my YouTube channel. Yeah. So it actually probably looks the best it could ever possibly look. At my hands, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, like, um, it's like... 20 years of technology makes it a lot easier, I imagine, because this is like, yeah, you edited you this on a computer, I imagine. No, it was analog. Oh, well, no, at that point it was a computer. Yes, it was digital. Yeah. Th this so is it was such on a an editing spooky system. shot. The flash? <laughs> yeah, red eyes and flash, I love it. That I would have speeded up, but, well, that I did speed up, but that one, I think, I don't know. Well, it would have been nice to have more time. It would have been nice to have like a whole day to shoot the video like anyone else in the world has. You know, we Chuck was literally shooting a sex scene that day at this ranch. Um, I showed up with the guys and we had like maybe for this whole video, I'd say the most time we spent on it was an hour. Wow. Maybe an hour, 15 minutes. So that in consideration, you know, actually this stuff, with the hay, yeah, that was the hay bales, and we moved to two locations. We had the hay bales section, and we had the um, that flatbed truck. truck, which was kind of near it. And we spent like an hour and fifteen minutes because Chuck had to shoot a whole movie. Jesus. And um, you know, we have. I mean, it's like you know, I don't want, I don't want to take away his time. You know, it's hard enough. So, I mean, it, it's a decent video, and the song is genuinely catchy. And they had matching shirts. You know, you got to say something about those matching shirts. I mean, it says at the end of the movie who did that, um, the costumes, yeah. which was basically those shirts. Our makeup man brought them from some designer. 
um, in really? like Belgium or something. Really, believe it or not, like some some other country, and it's on the credits of the of the actual movie. Um, but that was it. Was those T-shirts? I thought it was going to be something a little more than tie-dye. I remember the fact that because Kurt got in touch with uh, Little Mandarin, and mm -hmm. he said he didn't actually provide the vocals because he had like a sore throat or something. So it's all overdubbed by someone else. I don't remember who, but. Well, that's the guy that Sharon Kane wrote the song for, and then he did it. It's not yes. Chris's voice for, in any of it. Yeah, it's the it's that it's the Sharon Kane and the mystery singer, um, who who laid his voice, and there they are. Okay, so those are the guys in the boy band. Yeah, so that makes sense. The others wouldn't be in it because they were having sex scenes earlier, <laughs> and you really can't keep them around too long, right? It's like fly them in, shoot it, fly them out. Yeah. Tight budgets and tight holes or something. Finally happy. She's finally got a smile on her face. Oh, she's so... And she acts like she's just so innocent and sweet in this last scene. It's hysterical. Oh, yeah. Well, and I, you know, and I guess that time when we were doing this, this is when boy bands were like all the rage, right? So. Yeah, late 90s, early 2000s. Oh, so mm -hmm. many boy bands. So many. I remember that, and I, I'm not a big fan of boy bands, if I'm being honest. Yeah, the Backstreet Boys. They're no, decent. I mean, I am not either. <laughs> but not my kind of music. No. But I thought, you know, the appeal was really the whole thing with, you know, having the boy bands go all the way, I guess. Yeah, you boy bands I mean? are hot. But Let's make a movie about boy bands and just add a weird plot about the farm. And make it art. And, <laughs> and end it with it a beautiful vista shot of Los Angeles. A great... Oh, this may actually show who did the costumes, possibly. So it's a pretty huge cast for us, right? So, you know, it, it's, it was worth the 20000 Oh, oh it's, it's fag, FAG. Of course. Music video costume by FAG. And then there's somewhere where it has how you can order from FAG. But, yeah, right there. I doubt that that number still works or if that clothing line... Is even a thing, but you see the phone I, number was somewhere in Europe. Europe? Oh, Frankfurt, oh, Germany. Oh, okay. there we go. Attention, Stephen. Well, I'll ask some people in Germany if they know fag. <laughs> Do they wear it? Well, you know, it could be worth a lot of money right now if we had those still and I could put them on eBay, right? I mean, I'd wear some fag clothing. They look kind of nice. Actually, they weren't bad. For tie-dye, they were actually pretty cool for that time period. Mm. They were I mean, the, the 90s are coming back strong, so if you have them around, boys, put them on. Yeah, put them on or sell them. <laughs> so, yeah, that was Boy Band. What an amazing film that fueled the internet with Catalina Love. I mean, if it wasn't for this film, like, none of this here would be happening probably which blows my mind which i never even knew was a thing until covid when i started going on to youtube i'd never really even gone on to youtube um before covid but out of boredom and that's when i saw that boy band was a thing and and i discovered your channel which mm. keeps me in stitches constantly i mean you're you've really got that you've got that formula down mr psychopath oh, thank you and then of course uh, catalina collection all right, you boys at home, you you stay safe, get vaccinated, uh, yes, wear a condom, and I'll see you all next time. All right, take care. God, outros are so hard. I know. <laughs>